Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody in today, and this is the beginning of a new book. We'll be starting, no, part, third part of book 81. I was thinking all the time this is the beginning of a new book. Okay, third part of book 81, and this is the first program this afternoon for those of you out on television. Again, we just want to welcome you to our Bible study, and I have to take the time to thank you out there for your letters. My, how we enjoy mail time, don't we? Uh, we still manage to read them all. We may not all get them the same day they come, but sooner or later we get every letter read. So don't ever hold back from dropping us note. And again, I have to emphasize, please don't write two, three, four pages because then we can't get every letter written. But we do appreciate your letters, your gifts, your prayers, everything that has made this such a blessing to so many. For those of you here in the studio, we appreciate you're coming in. and Many of you have traveled a good distance here today, and we realize that. Okay, now we're going to get right into the book, and uh, we're going to pick up where we left off after our last taping. Now, for those of us here in the studio, that's over a month ago. For those of you out on television, it was yesterday or last week, whatever the case may be. So we're going to come back to where we left off in Daniel chapter 9, and we made rather a hurried commentary on the first two verses. I didn't really get to finish it like I'd like to, so I'm going to go back and touch on those just a moment before we drop into verse 3. So let's just start at verse 1. Oh, that reminds me. I want to, again, let our audience know we still have this book available. It's the one and only we've ever had, and uh, they still go out. We just got a whole semi-load again the other day. They are still going out by the hundreds, so they are available. And if you'd like a copy, just call the office, and we'll get them out to you. All right, but now in chapter 9, verse 1, remembering now that poor old Daniel is about 87, 88 years of age, having been kidnapped out of Jerusalem when he was probably 12 or 14, which tells you how long has he now been out there in the area of Babylon and Shushan. Well, well over the 70 years that he knew the captivity was to be. So what's in the old fellow's mind? Well, we should be getting back to Jerusalem one of these days. The 70 years of captivity has run its course. It's over. And I think that's why back in a, even in a previous verse in chapter 8, if you want to look at it in a minute, in verse 27, I think the old fellow was just getting so anxious for the opportunity to go back home to Jerusalem, which as far as we know, he never did. But look what he says in verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and I was sick. Certain days afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. Well, I think what he was really sick at, that he had spent all these years throughout that 70 years that was promised in prophecy, and still no sign of going back to Jerusalem. So anyway, in chapter 9 now, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Hazarus, of the seed of the Medes, now, you remember I pointed out in the last taping, we are already past the Babylonian kingdom, and by the miracle working power of God, old Daniel moves from Baghdad, or Babylon, up to Shushan, which is the capital of the Medes and Persians. Unbelievable that here this Jew survives the whole Babylonian time and now moves up into the Medan Syrian Empire and is still in a place of authority. It's just unbelievable, except that God is in it. All right, so now verse 2. In the first year of his reign, that is of Darius, or the, uh, the son of Ahasuerus, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years. Well, what number of years is he talking about? The 70. See? The 70 years should be fulfilled by now, and we should be ready to go back home. All right, now we're looking at it in just a moment, but let's finish the verse. Whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish or fulfill 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah prophesied it, but you've got to know your history and you've got to know your time. Jeremiah was writing about the time that Daniel was a little lad being carried out to Babylon, see? So Daniel knew Jeremiah, at least by name, if not personally. 
And so he's referring to his prophecy. But before we look at Jeremiah's prophecy, let's go all the way back. And I love to do this to show the scornful world that this book is like no other book. Nothing compares to this book. Because here Moses is writing in Leviticus chapter 26. Way back at the very beginning of the nation of Israel, you might say. And he's already predicting this 70 years captivity. Which won't happen for years and years later. See? Leviticus chapter 26. Drop in at verse 32. Leviticus chapter 26 verse 32. And God says through the prophet Moses, who we know wrote Leviticus, I will bring the land. They aren't even there yet, but they will be. And I will bring the land into desolation. Now, I've made the point on this program over and over down through the years. Any time the Jew was uprooted from the land, which we normally call the promised land, or that part of Palestine that was Israel, any time the Jew was absent from the land, it went into desolation. No one else could come in and cultivate it and take advantage of it. God made sure it went into desolation. See, and that's what old Arafat never agreed to. That's why when he was holding forth, he would say over and over, it was the Arabs' land. It's always been their land. It has always been a verdant, which meant green. It has always been a green land. No, it isn't. When Israel is out of the land, it becomes a total desolation. And I'll comment on that a little further on. All right, but here it is. See, God says, I will bring the land into desolation. Your enemies who dwell therein shall be astonished at it, the desolation. I will scatter you among the heathen, will draw out a sword after you. In other words, they would be invaded by these enemy nations. I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, your cities waste. Now, verse 34, so we know that Moses was talking about the 70-year captivity. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbaths. Now, for most people, that needs some defining, doesn't it? When Israel went into the promised land as part of the law, what were they to do with the productive end of the land every seventh year? Let it lay fallow. They were not to farm the orchards or the grain fields. The seventh year was to be a land sabbatical. But did the Jews do it? No, they never did. For 490 years, they never gave the seventh year sabbatical. All right, now look what the rest of the verse says. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lieth desolate, and you be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbaths. And how many would there be in 490 years? Seventy. So there's the promise of the coming 70 years of captivity down in Babylon while the land of Israel would lie fallow. Okay, now let's jump up to what Daniel is referring to, to one of his earlier contemporaries, Jeremiah chapter 25. And see, this is the beauty of Scripture. These aren't just fables corned up with, before the campfire. This is the immaculate, intrinsically prophetic word of God. Now here we have Jeremiah writing shortly before the Babylonian invasion and before the temple is destroyed. Verse 11. Sorry, honey. Chapter 25, verse 11. And Jeremiah writes, And this whole land. See? This whole land shall be a desolation, the same word that Moses used. Nothing is going to grow or survive. And the whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment 
And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon how long? Seventy years. See? All in line with prophecy. And so now then, let's come back to Daniel and carry on with what he's talking about, that all these years of 70 years out of the land, it should be time for them to be going back and reoccupying the land and rebuild the temple and so forth, which, of course, is going to happen as we're going to see before the afternoon is over. All right, verse 2 then again. So in the first year of this king's reign, uh, Ahasuerus or Darius, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, and I'm going to add, as well as Moses, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, again, just to rise above all of the statements from the Arab world, They'd like to make it sound like, like I've already alluded to Arafat, that it had always been green, it had always been productive, it had always been Arab lands. Well, now let's just show you how, what a lie that is. Come back with me. Now, I didn't intend to do this. See, that's why I told Iris coming up, you know, honey, I never know where I'm going to stop at 30 minutes. I, I have no way of knowing that. I don't come up here with, with a, a set... Uh, format or anything like that, because now I didn't intend to do this. But let's go back to Nehemiah, because the unbelieving world knows nothing of this, but yet we have to be aware of what the Word of God says. Go back to Nehemiah, and we're going to be doing this again later this afternoon, hopefully. Nehemiah chapter 2, just to show you that when Israel was gone those 70 years, nothing, nothing was done to embellish it, to bring it back into production, to get it ready for occupancy by whatever people might be doing. No, it stayed desolate for the whole 70 years. Nothing was done to bring it back into production. Nehemiah, chapter 2. And so he's sent by the king to go back and get ready to rebuild the city walls. Now Ezra, of course, was sent to rebuild the temple. But Nehemiah was sent back a good long while later to now rebuild the city walls and uh, make it preparatory for occupancy by the Jewish people. All right? Nehemiah chapter 2. And uh, let's just drop in at verse 17. Then I said unto them, those who were examining this with him, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem is teeming with Arabs. Is that what your Bible says? <laughs> see, that's what the ridiculous would try to tell us. After 70 years, there's nothing in Jerusalem. It's what? It's desolate. See? Now that's the point I'm trying to make. Don't believe all this garbage. Don't believe it. It's not true. When Israel is out of the land, it becomes a total desolation. God won't let anybody make anything of it. And, well, I might as well comment on it now. I was going to later. Even after the 70 A.D., when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and drove the Jews out, to go wherever they wanted, and they just literally became the wandering Jews of the dispersion. Again, did the Arab world come in and occupy Israel and Jerusalem and put it into production? Never happened. 1900 and some years, Palestine, now I use the word Palestine as the big area in which we have the land of Israel. So don't don't get on my case for calling Israel Palestine. Palestine is that geographical area. All right. From the destruction in 70 AD until around the turn of the century of 1900, so that's about 1830 years, it was a total desolation. Oh, there were a few little isolated pockets of people, of course. But by and large, the land was in total isolation. You know, I've always, uh, over the years, have referred to uh, Samuel Clemens. 
the author of Huckleberry Finn. We know him better as Mark Twain. And you've heard me refer to it more than once on the program. He traveled in the ancient land of Israel in the middle 1800s. I think it was around the time of our Civil War, around 1865. And he wrote in a book, uh, Innocence Abroad. And he was merely speaking of being abroad as an innocent traveler. And in that book, he gave this graphic description of the land of Israel at 1865. He said, the land is a total desolation. Not even the weeds of the desert will grow here. We traveled mile after mile and never saw another human being. The further we went toward Jerusalem, the hotter the sun got. By the time we got to Jerusalem, he said, again, I would not want to live here. Well, you see, that was all during that period of time when Israel was out in the dispersion and the land of Israel was a desolation. Now then, I started out, before I'd even seen this book by Mark Twain, <coughs> from a gentleman who had been in World War II, detached from the American army, and was attached to something in the land of Israel. So he served a couple years at the very height of World War II in Jerusalem. Well, he was in one of my home Bible studies in Iowa after I began teaching up there. And that was when we first became aware of this very fact. He was telling us that it was such a next term he used, God forsaken. He said, why in the world anybody would want the promised land? What was God thinking when he gave such a worthless piece of real estate to Israel? Well, that's the way it was even yet at the 1940s, see? It was still a total desolation. Well, the first time Iris and I got there in 1975, it wasn't much more now because I still remember as we were coming down the Jordan Valley, I said to her, I said, honey, how in the world could God ever call this the land of milk and honey? It was still, for the most part, just barren desert. Now, of course, it's all just every time we go back, there's more cultivated area. My, you remember last fall in the area of the... Uh, of the Sermon on the Mount, my goodness, what used to be just brush and sand dunes is now banana groves. See, everything is just constantly increasing. But the point I'm trying to make is that when the Jew is out of the promised land, it is desolation. And don't ever believe the propaganda of anything other than that. All right, now reading on in Nehemiah. Verse 17 again, you see the distress written, how Jerusalem lieth waste. Now remember, this is at the end of those 70 years, even quite a few over. And Jerusalem is lying waste. The gates thereof are burned with fire. Has anybody fixed them? No, they're still laying there charred, just like they were when the Babylonians destroyed it. Nobody lifted a finger, see? And all our people are being fed all this garbage. When Israel is out of the land, beloved, it's desolate. And God sees to it that it stays that way. Now, even after, after modern days, when uh, people would try to go and uh, build up some of the cities, the Romans, of course, tried it. And every time they get started rebuilding a city, what would God destroy it with? Earthquakes. In fact, those are a lot of the places that we go and visit when we're over there. Bet Sean is a good example, right down there south of the Sea of Galilee. It was evidently a beautiful Roman colony. But before they finished building the city, what happened? Earthquake. Totally destroyed it. It all lays there in rubble, see? And then the malaria came in when uh, the Hula Valley was swamp. It was just totally infested with malaria. And malaria was so prevalent in the land of what we call Israel that no more than two generations could survive it. They'd die off from malaria. So then the drought came in. The rain stopped. So God used those three areas to keep it desolate. Earthquakes, malaria, and drought. And that's all it took. And for the most part, it stayed desolate. All right, just a couple more verses here in Nehemiah, and we'll get back to Daniel. All the gates are burned with fire, verse 17. 
let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we be no more reproached. Because you want to remember, in antiquity, the wall was the first line of defense. Then verse 18, Nehemiah says, I told them of the hand of my God who was good upon me, as also the king's word that had been spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But now watch this. When Sanballat the Hodonite and Tobiah his servant, the Ammonite, now stop a minute. What kind of people are Ammonites? Huh? Arabs. See? So just as soon as the Arabs got wind that these Jews were thinking about fixing the place up, they opposed them. Then already. No different than it is today. See? All right, so reading on. Verse 19. So when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshep the Arabian. See? Now that makes it plain enough. When they heard it, that they were going to rebuild the city. They laughed us to scorn. They despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Well, the poor idiots, you know what they didn't know? Nehemiah had the contract in his hand from the king to get whatever he needed from the force of Lebanon or from the quarries. He had it all okayed by the king. And these Arabs didn't know that, see? All right, then verse 20. Nehemiah says, then I answered them and said, the God of heaven. See, that's always what makes the difference. The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you, to the Arabs, you have no portion. You have no right. You have no memorial in Jerusalem. And beloved, it's just as valid today as it was back here in 606 B.C. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that it's still the promised land and God is in control. All right, now, time is just about gone. I didn't intend to do any of that, but uh, maybe there's a reason for it. Daniel chapter 9 now again, and we'll move on. Verse 3, that's what's on the board <laughs> Daniel chapter 9, verse 3. So I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Verse 4. I prayed unto the Lord my God, made my confession, and said, O Lord God, the great and dreadful God. Now, if anybody knew how great and dreadful, by now Daniel, with all of his visions, was totally aware, wasn't he? So he knows what he's talking about. He has seen God evidenced in more ways than one over these previous 70 years. And so keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Now, what is that telling you? Who is Daniel primarily writing to? Well, his fellow Jews, see? That's what this is all for. Even though we have a lot of Gentile prophecy in here, yet it is still Jewish ground, see? And so the object of his prayer are the people of Israel out there still in captivity and haven't as yet made their way back to Jerusalem, although that's certainly now in the immediate future. So right, we're, we're dealing primarily now with the Jews under the law, even though they've been away from any temple worship, and yet this is all Jewish language to them that love him and keep his commandments. That's exactly what Jesus in, uh, instructed the people of his day. Keep the commandments. I might be biting off more than I can chew. I think I can bring you back. I hope I can find it back in Matthew, where he told the rich young ruler. My goodness, I hope I can find it. You know? I think it's 19, but I'm not sure. Oh, I'm in Mark. No wonder I can't find it. Come back with me. Matthew. Yeah. Chapter 19. Verse 16. Because I want you to see how identical the language is. Now, I don't know how many of you got to see the program this morning. I was getting ready, and I just got little bits and pieces of it. Did you? Did you see what I was driving at? 
Oh, when you compare the language of James, it's word for word what Moses said back during Exodus. Not even close to what Paul said, but it all fits if you leave it where it belongs. All right, now here's another one. See, exact words that Daniel is using. Oh, wow, down to two minutes. Matthew 19, verse 16. Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do? I think I emphasized that this morning, didn't I? Yeah. Matthew 19, verse 16. Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now look at his answer. And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Now that's plain, isn't it? Why? Because they were under law. They knew nothing of grace. And so that was exactly the situation that Daniel is speaking of. And I'll flip back there for the minute that we have left. Back to man, Daniel chapter 9. So that his praying is based on his love for God as a good law-keeping Jew, and he is keeping his commandments. But the nation? <laughs> Anything but. The nation has just almost become degraded, see? And uh, we'll take the next verse until the half hour is up. Verse 5. Now he's praying on behalf of his people. We, the nation, Israel, now, this doesn't affect us Gentiles. Don't ever try to come back here and, and pray like this for us today. We have Paul's prayers to copy. This is Daniel praying on behalf of his people, Israel. We have sinned, and we have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly, and we have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts, and from thy judgments, in other words, what's he referring to? All the facets of the law, see? Which the Jewish people should have known if they didn't. Even though they were in captivity, they still had that law and temple worship in their memory, if nothing else, because it had been drilled into them. Just like cults do today. They were taught those commandments and those rules and regulations from infancy on. So it just became second nature for them to keep all these things. Well, we'll pick it up here in the next half hour. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.